Hello and welcome to the fourth webinar of the Heritage Science Academy, organized in the frame of the Iberian Heritage Science Project and in the frame of the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science. It's a particular pleasure today that will be presented a topic that is used a lot uh, in many laboratories across the globe, um, and specifically to explore uh, surfaces of objects. And I'm sure that we'll see many very, very interesting examples from many galleries and museums across the world on the topic of hyperspectral imaging. Just to say that the recording of this particular webinar will be available on video later on YouTube. However, for all of those who have joined us live today, please make use of the chat and particularly of the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, in order to submit your questions, which we will do at the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Jana Striova probably needs no introduction. She's a well-known heritage scientist at the Italian National Research Council with an academic background in analytical chemistry and material science, as well as in science for the conservation of cultural heritage and management of research infrastructures. She coordinates the team developing an integrated and user-oriented approach to access the Iperian HS facilities and the training events for the heritage science community. She currently coordinates several national and regional projects on advanced spectroscopy and conservation of photographic materials. And joining us today as well is Dr. Irina Sandu, who is conservation scientist at the Munch Museum and has been since 2016, developing research focusing specifically on its collection of art objects and reference materials uh, housed at the museum. Has a PhD in chemistry for conservation and more than 20 years of experience in research for art and conservation. She authored and co-authors a number of book chapters, monographs, and more than 95 papers in peer-reviewed journals. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Jana and Irina to present uh, the topic of hyperspectral imaging to us. Over to you, Jana. Thank you, Mattia. And in, uh, in this talk, I will focus on uh, multi and hyperspectral imaging uh, spectroscopy accessible through the MOLA platform of the Iperian HS infrastructure. Browsing our catalog of services, you can find the MOLA techniques categorized into 2D, 3D analysis, multi hyperspectral imaging and mapping, point analysis, and remote sensing. Today, we will uh, concentrate on close range applications of the uh, this of the reflectance imaging spectroscopy of small and medium sized polychrome objects, mainly from the museum collections, such as easel paintings, illuminated manuscripts, and paper based artifacts. I will start uh, with short historical notions on infrared reflectography. To continue with the theoretical background and terminology, I will provide you with the examples of RIS data processing including machine learning methodologies, statistical analysis, and spectral mapping. I will conclude uh, with future perspectives, and then I will hand over to Irina. The key advantage of reflectance imaging spectroscopy is that it integrates, is based on the integration of spectroscopic and imaging approach. That can be exploited for disclosing hidden features, such as underdrawing, the pentimenti, subsequent retouchings, overpaintings, restoration intervention, but it can be also used for mapping of various inorganic and organic components. It can retrieve accurately the color information. Ideally, it should be 
a first screening method applied in the investigation of artworks to guide further single-sighted analysis or other imaging uh, methodologies. And this data can be profitably employed for georeferencing of other data. Risk consists in irradiation of the painting surface with the illumination source and in detecting the backscattered radiation with a suitable device. The measured quantity is the intensity reflected by the same painting or by the surface at different wavelengths. In order to have a set of calibrated images, an adjustment needs to be made and implying the measurements of the reference and dark intensities must be performed. The dark image is considered as a fixed bias and therefore it has to be eliminated. Risk can carry uh, a range of definitions that of course may evolve over time. And uh, these depend essentially on the application and acquisition modality. Multiband imaging generally refers to the acquisition of uncalibrated images with very broad bandwidth, uh, bigger than uh, 100 nanometers, captured using the CCD camera, such as the modified digital single lens reflex and bandpass filters. The number of bands is inversely proportional to the full width at the half maximum, the smaller the full width, the higher the number of bands. The multiband captures characteristic spectral information about the objects. However, the uncalibrated image set cannot produce uh, the reflectance spectrum. On the other hand, multispectral imaging is defined as the acquisition of calibrated images with bandwidths of tens to hundreds uh, of nanometers, whereas the hyperspectral imaging is characterized by the bandwidths of 10 nanometers or less. Uh, the method, uh, of course, is based on the, um, uh, the collection of the reflected light for each pixel in the image. The collected data form the so-called spectral data cube. The two dimensions represent the spatial extent. And then uh, the third one refers to the spectral information. What are the principal parameters that distinguish numerous uh, prototypes developed worldwide and or are available uh, offshore. The covered spectral range that is linked to the choice of the detector, the number of wavelength channels, which uh, is correlated, correlates with uh, spectral resolution. The spatial resolution affects the quality of the image. Uh, we can talk about different modality of acquisition. And the last parameter that I report, uh, but not the least, is also the price of such a device. In the most schematic way, a spectral imaging system entails the illumination that should be um, possibly free from strong emission lines and bright enough to minimize the exposure time, usually involving halogen lamps. Focusing optics that can be either lens or mirrors. And we need also a means of wavelength selection that affects various instrument, uh, instrumental designs. And of course, we need a detector to collect uh, the uh, reflected radiation. The origin of RIS date back to the 30s when the near sensitive emotions became available, allowing photographers to practice this new technique. From this period onward, the possibility to visualize an often subtle dissimilar behavior of materials in the near helped heritage researchers and archaeologists to describe certain object characteristics not apparent to the human eye. The uh, breakthrough was, of course, the application of the Vidicon detector in the 60s and a further a technological advancement allowed for the development of new detectors uh, and that's when the wideband uh, infrared reflectography has gradually in expanded into the multi and hyperspectral modality starting from the 90s. The importance of the multi model investigation has been already envisioned by the Dutch physicist and university teacher Van Aspen de Boer in his article published in 68 in Applied Optics. 
he anticipated that the infrared reflectography could contribute to a better understanding of the painting techniques, a workshop practice, especially if used in conjunction with other methods such as X-ray radiography and analysis of the painting materials. In his fundamental work, uh, he laid the theoretical and experimental basis of the infrared reflectography by introducing the use of lead sulfide vidicon cameras that were characterized by a broad spectral sensitivity up to two microns. The uh, obtained, uh, here you can see the comparison of the infrared photograph and the reflectogram assembly. Uh, at the beginning, the obtained images were printed and manually assembled into a mosaic to pass only later to digital mosaicing. While having a good spectral sensitivity, its scarce light sensitivity demands for an intense illumination. Moreover, images are characterized by a very poor contrast due to the limited number of gray levels. Uh, you can see that uh, the single reflectograms are also brighter in the center and darker on the borders due to the non-uniform sensitivity of the detector's area. Therefore, corrections such as flat field must be apply applied to compensate for such non-uniformities. The visibility of the underdrawing, as was proved later, however, of many common materials such as sepia, red ochre, or iron gold ink became uh, invisible at these wavelengths as you can see in this mock-up. Uh, for example, the red ochre is almost transparent at very low uh, wave numbers. Iron gold ink starts to be transparent from about 900 nanometers. And on the other hand, carbon is a very strong absorber. It follows uh, that the optimum visualization of the underdrawing is determined by the specific combination of paint and underdrawing material. And it depends on the contrast uh, between the drawing and the preparation and on the transparency of the paint layers that generally increases as a function of the wavelength. Indeed, uh, the spectral sensitivity of the instruments is mainly set by the detector, uh, by the material of the detectors. We can see that the low cost silicon based CCDs with higher intensity resolution and more uniform response than Vidicon have their spectral sensitivity limited to about one micron. As a consequence, the acquired images have a very scarce informative content. On the other hand, indium gallium arsenide uh, detectors can strongly improve the visibility of the underdrawing features due to the extended uh, spectral coverage uh, to about 1.7 microns. We have also extended in-gas detectors having sensitivity up to 2.5 uh, microns, uh, but they require two-stage cooling for good signal-to-noise ratio. Other detectors as uh, germanium-based are quite similar, but they are very costly. And to reach to the mid infrared, we need to uh, opt for the mercury cadmium telluride uh, detectors. So here can, you can see the comparison of the underdrawing visibility when acquired with a regular CCD detector as compared to the wideband, uh, you know, uh, scanner acquisition uh, in this specific case uh, covering to 1.7 microns. Of course, the reflectance imaging can be used also for uh, chemical mapping. Uh, the visible to near infrared region provides information on electronic transitions occurring to the number of different phenomena. And the advantage of accessing the so-called shortwave infrared gives us the possibility to exploit the combination band. First, uh, and uh, different orders of overtones. Um, we can uh, bear in mind that the International Organization for Standardization specifies the division of optical radiation into the 
uh, near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared uh, spectral windows uh, with these characteristics, we can very often uh, encounter a different uh, division scheme that is based on the sensor's response. That's why we can uh, see the nomenclature such as visible near, extended visible near, near short wave infrared, mid wave infrared, and long wave infrared. It's important to remember that uh, only near and severe regions are referred to as reflected infrared, whereas higher or longer wavelengths are referred to as uh, thermal infrared. Imaging can be performed in a wide variety of hardware configurations. A full field approach is the one shot system solution allowing to acquire the multispectral data in a practical and fast way. Uh, such systems might have the potential to expand the usage of multiband imaging also to less resourceful institutions and practitioners. Photographic systems, however, use separate optical system, lens, filters to acquire a spectral band, and this may possibly cause uh, uh, problems in ensuring that these are then spatially and radiometrically comparable. And of course, we need to then uh, opt for some registration algorithms to correct for the distortions and uh, aberrations. On the other hand, the scanning approach uh, with respect to the wide field imaging provides improved spectral resolution by collecting a highly resolved spectrum either at each line or each point of pixel on the sample. The so-called push broom line scanning is achieved by moving either the detector or the object and then collecting the reflected radiation through the slit, uh, which is then uh, dispersed uh, by uh, the grating or by the prism and then, uh, uh, then impinges on the 2D detector. Generally speaking, the dispersive, uh, dispersive spectrometers offer a higher spectral resolution with, the, with, with respect to the filter-based system at the cost of high demand in the chromatic aberration tolerance of the lens. What we achieve, of course, is huge dynamics, uh, better illumination uniformity at the cost of longer acquisition time, the instrument size and weight, and of course, these uh, instruments are very uh, costly. A special um, device that combines the whisk broom scanning with filtering is the single point scanner developed at the CNR, National Institute of Optics. The simultaneous wavelength collection is performed through a square shaped fiber bundle. You can see the six by six matrix arrangement of the fibers that uh, then collect the uh, backspectral irradiation to the set of uh, photodiodes uh, that are either silicon based or uh, extended in gas sensors. Uh, what we are doing right now is to, we are coupling uh, the free uh, fibers with uh, hyperspectral sensors. So uh, we have a truly uh, unique instrument uh, to be utilized within uh, the infrastructure. Uh, the philosophy uh, of the scanner is based on the use of catoptic lens and single point detection uh, that ensures aberration free images. The main advantage of such instrument as compared to the analogous devices is that data are hardware registered in the entire spectral range from uh, about 400 nanometers to 2.5 nanometers. Therefore, no correction and alignment post-processing is necessary. The main benefit of the home-built scanner is its full controllability, versatility from both the analytical and the mechanical point of view. Uh, we have at the moment, at the moment two line imagers uh, covering respectively uh, 
the range is from 400 to 1,000 nanometers and from uh, 900 to 2.5 uh, microns uh, that can be uh, accessed through the IPDNHS infrastructure. And we have the scanning with near uh, multispectral device covering the above mentioned uh, spectral range. When you click on the in our website on those uh, tools, you can um, uh, read all the technical specifics of each device. What is also important that you uh, get in touch with the person in charge to discuss whether or not uh, the device is suitable for the research program that you are trying to address before uh, submitting the proposal. Of course, you can also refer to the user help desk. Um, this method alone has a robust but not exhaustive capacity for the complete characterization of the composite painted systems constituted artworks. Therefore, RIS should uh, be complemented with other spectroscopic or non-spectroscopic sensors to measure a uh, large variety of properties. The specificity, specificity of our infrastructure is that you can combine different methods in one research proposal to obtain the necessary data, whether they are single-sided analysis uh, or 2D uh, imaging for hidden data details or for the degradation phenomena. To name just a few techniques par excellence is of course the XRF or XRD mapping that complements very well uh, the information obtained by this. But we can also go and examine the morphological characteristics and in-depth information uh, of the object by, for example, optical coherence uh, tomography. I will pass on to some examples of uh, RIS data processing. Of course, there is a huge number of methods that can be used and we can only showcase uh, some examples to um, provide you with uh, uh, what can be achieved uh, from uh, RIS uh, data queue. If you ask yourself whether it's possible to obtain precise colorimetric coordinates from a uh, visible portion, yes, it is, provided that uh, the illumination detection geometry uh, follows the norm by CA, that is to say, uh, the 45 to zero degrees illumination detection, and even very small deviations from this can cause very huge error in the CLAP calculation. So we can then use those uh, data, for example, to uh, monitor conservation information by collecting the uh, data before and after the cleaning, and uh, we can quantify and uh, document very well the what was uh, going on uh, to the surface uh, under the treatment. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, the advantage of the shortwave internet region uh, in, on this painting by, uh, Madonna, uh, by Raffaello Madonna del Granduca. We can scroll the data set, which is a zoom in on this area on the painting as a, um, individual reflectograms, and we see as the wavelength increases, gradually even the very black background becomes transparent and we can discern the spolvero technique that has been used uh, by Raphael to originally uh, sketch the capital behind the head of Jesus, which is quite unique because to obtain good contrast black on black uh, is uh, quite difficult. Uh, of course, we can uh, only have a look at the reflectograms and amuse ourselves sometimes uh, with the changes uh, that the painter uh, has made in the different stages of the artwork realization. But we can also uh, use um, advanced uh, data processing to try to increase uh, the information that can be extracted. Uh, this can be done, for example, 
by exploiting artificial intelligence. Uh, here in specific, we have used neural networks, which are a subset of machine learning and are at the heart of deep learning algorithms. Neural networks represent the structure of the human brain with uh, neurons and synapses. Possibly we can have millions of neurons capable of analyzing and memorizing information. They are organized into the layers. This is the input layer that receives uh, the information. We have uh, hidden layers that perform some computation and passes the signal on. Uh, and we have the output layer that uh, furnishes uh, the result. Of course, uh, as every uh, algorithm, it needs to be first trained on the known uh, set of sample with uh, known percentage of coverage of the uh, underdrawing. And once such algorithm is learned, uh, and uh, trained and validated, we know everything about the possible error in the prediction, we can use it uh, on the real case uh, study. In this case, uh, the neural network has extrapolated image uh, that has been then subtracted from the near measured image. Uh, so um, uh, the scope was, of course, to eliminate this visible cover that is hampering the visibility of uh, the underdrawing underneath. Uh, risk can be complemented also by the optical coherence tomography. In this case, to shed light on some past intervention. Here, the OCT maps are uh, visualized as scattered, scattered maps. We can see uh, different uh, acquisition uh, at a different depth uh, uh, into the structure of the painting. And you can see that the morphology changes in at the depth of about 60 microns. We can see this crisscross structure, which actually is related to the uh, imprint of the canvas that uh, has been utilized in the transfer of this painting in, uh, onto the new uh, support. So we can add uh, the, let's say, third dimension uh, that uh, is not typical for the RIS uh, technique. Uh, the same machine learning uh, algorithm has been used also to enhance information in the drawing by Michelangelo. Uh, who has been very known for reusing many times the same paper. And in this case, uh, he has drawn some uh, figures that were then covered by uh, architectural study. So here you have the raw uh, reflectogram, and this is the enhanced uh, uh, information uh, processed data. Of course, uh, we cannot completely remove these black lines because uh, of course this is the same material so this is not uh, at the moment possible but still it was possible to link the shape of the figure to uh, other anatomical studies made by Michelangelo around that period and this helped to date better the origin of uh, this uh, beautiful drawing. Um, we can exploit also uh, different sensors uh, that can be hardware, uh, let's say, um, joined on one uh, device. So in this case, we have a laser triangulator uh, that simultaneously acquires the um, topography of the measured surface, um, as well as uh, it's keeping the optical head in focus. Uh, during the measurements. We can exploit uh, this uh, information and I'll show you the example of the Botticelli detached uh, fresco. Uh, for example, to characterize the giornate, that, that is to say the, um, the areas worked in one uh, day. So here you see the 3D model displayed as a raking light image that is obtained through the first derivative of the acquired profiles. What is important and what is very 
uh, useful that uh, the acquired data are perfectly uh, co-registered. So we don't need to apply an extra algorithm uh, to obtain uh, such co-registration. In this modality where the giornate are simply colored, uh, we can see that, for example, the head of the saint was uh, elaborated in a very small giornata because uh, he has probably uh, wanted to do it uh, with a greater care. We can see some uh, abrasions, we can quantify them, uh, and we can also quantify, for example, uh, the thickness of the material, uh, of the original material that was uh, preserved during the detachment uh, process when the fresco was uh, um, positioned on a new substrate and this depth or this thickness is on the order of one uh, millimeter. Um, this uh, perfect, let's say, uh, registration of different modalities of data is very uh, useful because it's very, let's say, also very user friendly and uh, all the observations can be done in a quite um, easy uh, way. So here you can see the reflectogram, uh, which of course reveals some preparatory drawings further. You can see some pentimenti, we, we see two hands on the clock and only one head uh, in the pictorial stage was realized. And we see the 3D uh, model, which can be further analyzed uh, to obtain quantitative information, either on the def di different uh, defects, or uh, in this case, uh, we have measured the incisions that have been uh, made to transfer the preparatory drawing onto the uh, intona core. Uh, importance of metrically correct uh, data plays important role when uh, we compare different uh, uh, artworks with the same subjects. And for example, in this case, um, uh, the topic was to understand whether or not these two authors, uh, Rubens and Fever, uh, have, could have used the same uh, preparatory cartoon. Of course, Rubens is uh, it's the original artwork on uh, it's a painting, uh, while Fever uh, has uh, inspired himself to realize a tapestry. So by comparison of the data uh, as acquired by Ries, it was possible uh, to hypothesize that the cartoon was the same because it perfectly overlaps besides some uh, deformation that are uh, off to the hanging of the tapestry. And uh, by the application of the uh, interferometric uh, technique, uh, we can uh, we can obtain a um, 3D model of uh, the morphology, so we can study it uh, thread by thread, and uh, we can fuse uh, the data uh, with the colorimetric information. Uh, about the spectrum mapping, of course, uh, there is a huge number of algorithms that can be used to classify materials. Uh, the spectral angle mapper is uh, one of the leading classification uh, approaches consisting in of obtaining the angles formed between the reference and the image spectrum, uh, treating them as vectors in a space with dimension equal to the number of bands. Another uh, algorithm is the spectral correlation mapper, which is a modification of the sum. Instead of angles, uh, it measures uh, covariance, it measures the Euclidean distances. It's a derivative of Pearson correlation coefficient. And uh, we can have uh, the numbers that range from zero one, from minus one to plus one, indicating perfect positive or negative relationship. 
uh, by setting a properly a threshold value, it's possible to define then areas with the same spectral behavior. It's also possible to automatically identify the materials and pigments, but the success of such procedure depends on the uh, discrimination power of the spectra library that we use. Uh, in, on this example, I will uh, go over the procedure that can be, of course, applied uh, to similar data sets. So uh, we go back to the St. Agostino Studio by Botticelli, and we focus on the warm hues. So what we can do, we can uh, extract the spectral uh, information. In this case, we have done it for the clock, for the book, and for the drawer. And what's important to emphasize is that to obtain good correlation maps, we use only the portion of the spectrum that uh, bears some characteristic spectral features, the so-called spectral end members. In this case, we have used only the visible portion of the spectrum, and we have obtained monochromatic uh, correlation maps. These can be then combined into a trichromatic uh, uh, space so as to concentrate all the information in one image. So we have assigned the clock spectrum, the red channel, the drawer green channel, and the book is assigned with the blue channel. So we can see, for example, that the clock co uh, correlates well with the material used for the uh, coat of arms. We can see that the book materials correlate quite well. Uh, they are rendered in the blue uh, color while the robe of the saint appears magenta, uh, indicating that it's a mixture of the two before mentioned pigments. We can also uh, reveal the composition of those uh, pigments, cinnabar, yellow ochre, and red ochre. In this case, uh, the uh, measurements were um, complemented by XRF uh, imaging. We can exploit also the principal competent analysis that, of course, concentrates all the information into the reduced uh, uh, representative score images. And we can play with them. For example, uh, on this drawing by Leonardo, we can concentrate on uh, this portion of the drawing and we can either uh, analyze it as a traditional false color imaging in which uh, usually one infrared channel is combined with red and green one and the iron gold ink is rendered in this uh, typical reddish hue or we can um, use the PC uh, score images in this case the second third and fourth to combine them in the trichromatic space. Uh, and we uh, can see clearly the, the areas that have been realized with uh, the metal point. Sometimes uh, it can be uh, beneficial to uh, compare different uh, kind of um, uh, processing uh, what is very useful is to overlap uh, all this process uh, data uh, to single out uh, any complementary uh, information. So, for example, on the painting uh, Madonna of the Rabbit by Manet, we can see uh, the trichromatic image created by mixing the infrared channels. We usually opt for the channels that have some huge spectral variations uh, to um, differentiate, uh, for example, uh, the blue pigments. And we can quite nicely see that there is a, a portion of the canvas that has been added in during some uh, conservation intervention. We can, um, the PC analysis that we have seen before, we can choose and we can apply it also only to some uh, spectral channels. Uh, moreover, uh, here we have uh, eliminated portion of the cube by setting tolerance values on the LAB uh, coordinates. So we have targeted uh, only 
blue areas. A spectral coloration map in this case uh, can reveal the distribution of red yellows and uh, oh, sorry of uh, yellow and red ochres that is uh, codified in green and in orange uh, is codified the zinc yellow. Uh, lastly, we can see the distribution of uh, two different uh, blues, cobalt, which is codified in lila, and uh, Russian blue that is codified uh, in electric blue. How about chemical imaging of organic binders? Uh, yes, we can obtain that. Uh, in order to chemically image the organic media, we need to go for the hyperspectral imaging uh, characterized by possible high spatial and high spectral resolution covering the shor short uh, wave infrared region. In this example, the oil uh, and alkyd resin uh, shown respectively in red and blue uh, show typically uh, typical spectral features of uh, uh, oils, but the later can be uh, discerned by the overtone uh, of the aromatic CH, this shoulder, and the combination band of the aromatic C double bond C and the aromatic CH. Uh, we can exploit in this case the first derivative spectroscopy. Uh, because uh, even the small changes can result in a huge, uh, uh, let's say, change of slope. And therefore, we can uh, exploit this for the mapping of these materials. You can see that the false color map uh, showing the distribution of the oil medium and alkyd medium. And by coupling it with the XRF uh, analysis, we can show we can see that zinc and titanium whites were associated with both binding media, whereas the barium based white was associated only with the uh, oil medium. Uh, the last thing that I would like to point is uh, the direction towards the mid uh, infrared reflectance, which is really exciting uh, uh, research area that has been uh, little exploited, uh, mainly due to the high cost of the uh, detectors and uh, the originally limited spectral uh, ranges that were uh, enabled by uh, these hyperspectral cameras. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the researchers in Perugia are now working on the uh, new hyperspectral camera that will cover all the, uh, let's say, uh, mid infrared region, so we can stay tuned whether uh, and when they will appear on our uh, catalog of services. A different approach uses the single point sensors uh, that uh, don't use the line scanning, but they use the uh, devices and they move the painting so as to uh, obtain a broadband spectral imaging. Of course, this is producing a huge uh, amount of data. And uh, I will then uh, finish with the future perspectives, uh, which uh, of course is to stretch further the spectral range to encompass as broad spectral interval as possible. Uh, we um, uh, testimony and increased association of multimodal sensors, which of course implies the growing data complexity. So we can expect that uh, new advanced methods of data analysis for proper data treatment will be developed as uh, at the same time, uh, rapidly developing field will also foresee scanners producing already registered multimodal data sets. And we can see also uh, the advancement on the side of the data fusion and machine learning methodologies. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I give the word to Irina. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Jana. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. And also thank you, Mattia, for the introduction. 
Uh, my name is Irina Sandu, and I'm the conservation scientist of the Munch Museum in Oslo, Norway. And uh, towards the end of 2020, uh, I have uh, submitted this application for a project entitled Color Changes in Munch Paintings and Study of the Artist Painting Materials to um, ask for both MOLAB and fixed lab transnational access. And uh, we were lucky enough to be granted this access to both facilities. And so, um, okay, I'm trying to understand. I should just, okay, just click on, okay. Uh, and so um, we uh, received the, the MOLAB groups uh, at the end, um, in the second half of 2021. Uh, and, um, uh, Fix Lab is still um, a work in progress, uh, and probably now in May, my colleague Yin, who is also part of the project, will uh, will go to Paris to the synchrotron facility. So this presentation will uh, make an overview of the access project, uh, both for MOLAB and just a little bit about Fix Lab, um, which were the objects, uh, which are the objects under study. Uh, the mobile equipment that came to Oslo to our museum and some insights from preliminary scientific results and of course the dissemination and publication plans. So as you see here, uh, I included some pictures so you have an idea of um, the people who were involved, not all the people actually from Molab are here in these pictures, but you can see the group uh, who came uh, in September together with um, me and Yin and our head of section. Uh, in the picture, you see me, uh, Irina Sand, and also my colleague Yin, who is a painting conservator. And actually she is one who got this idea to study these uh, objects in our collection. Uh, because as you see further on, they display some specific uh, conservation uh, issues and challenges. And this access of MOLAB involved many groups from different institutions from Italy and also from France. And they came in four distinct periods, uh, one group in September, uh, one between September and October, then again in October and November. And uh, of course, uh, it was not only multi and hyperspectral um, laboratory equipment that came, there were many others because we asked also for point analysis, not only for scanning devices. And then, as I said, now in May, we hope also have access to the Ipanema uh, laboratory, to the synchrotron facility near Paris in France. So what were these research questions in this project? Um, we are all proposing two lines on investigation. First, line is about five paintings that were created by Edvard Munch that Probably many of you know him as the author of the scream. By the way, we already had the MOLAB in 2017 regarding the scream and the series of scream paintings or prints and drawings with this motive. And then in the second line, we are also planning to do some studies on um, samples taken from uh, paint tubes because in our collection, besides the paintings on canvas, prints and drawings, we also have a huge original uh, artist material collection that is a reference collection for research in conservation. And so these paintings I'm speaking about, uh, they were made by Edvard Munch between 1907 and 1908 um, in a period where uh, when he lived in Germany in uh, Warnemude, a coastal area. And nowadays these paintings as observed by my colleague in and other conservators we have here at the museum display some um, darkening phenomena, especially in some areas as you can see in the images where there are red paints and also in blue area of paint. And these paintings are also very distinct in the um, uh, whole landscape of artistic production of Munch because uh, the paint is applied uh, by brush strokes that are quite heavy loaded and not so much mixed as colors. And sometimes even the, the paint is squeezed, was squeezed from the tube. And so sometimes you can see all these brush strokes and if you are able to get very close, uh, 
uh, in the crack or somewhere where you can um, actually observe the stratigraphy of, uh, of these paintings, you can see that uh, beneath these darkened areas that are superficial uh, layers, there are other uh, layers where, uh, that are still in a more uh, vivid color. Um, regarding the, the objects under study, as I mentioned, there are five paintings uh, on canvas. And for some reason, you don't see the drum boy. I don't know why, why he's not here, but yeah. Um, and these two first, the drum boy and old man environment that, that you can see on the left of the screen, they have been quite um, analyzed in the past. But, uh, we had the collaboration with the NTNU, the Color Lab. Uh, laboratory in Geovic here in Norway, and they did some multispectral analysis on Old Man and Barna Mudem. But of course, there were still questions to answer, and we needed to know more about uh, the layers uh, and these areas of dark and pink. And then uh, Ian added to the list also the other three paintings, displaying a similar uh, phenomenon. And besides these five paintings, as I said, we also made a selection of around uh, 15, 20 paint tubes, specifically for ultramarine cobalt blue and red lake as Arizarin, because as I said, this uh, darkening phenomena is present in red and um, red in, uh, blue color areas. And uh, we have in our collection more than 900 tubes of different brands, different manufacturers, and so we had to select some uh, in samples and so from these tubes that could cover a broader range of not only manufacturer, but also um, some different countries. And we prepared uh, some of them that were less viscous. We spread the paint on glass sides and we left them dry because this was required from uh, Panema, from the specialist there for the microscopic studies. They also asked from some cross sections. So practically these tubes will be taken for analysis in three different prepared uh, ways. Regarding the, the mobile equipment and the first results we got from this uh, four weeks of access that I mentioned in 2021, um, as you can see, we have some example from the use of uh, um, macro XRF mapping. Uh, sometimes the paintings had to rotate or to get upside down be able to scan a specific area that was of interest. Uh, or um, in other cases, uh, we have to ensure that the, as you can see, Letitia there with the VR setup, that the instrument for the actual analysis goes um, very close to the painting and get a good result. And uh, our challenges as user were several. And first of all, um, not sure that all of you know, but the Munk Museum uh, had um, uh, a project of moving from an old uh, building uh, to a newer building, much bigger, with in horizontal, in the vertical, from horizontal to vertical, to say like that. And the first question we had: Where are we going to have the Molab access? Because this Molab access happened actually in the middle of this moving project. But considering that the paintings were still in the storage area in the old building and that having to move them for MOLAB would have created much more uh, complications. And we decided, okay, we will have MOLAB uh, in the old building uh, in Toyan area in Oslo. And we actually were quite lucky there because we uh, the building was not em completely empty, but for many people already have been moved to the new one. So we could manage to uh, place the instruments in different location in a conservation area. And then I had to treat with the, all logistics and also the procedures and the, you know, the papers that you have to organize the delivery and then the sending back all the instruments. And this also sometimes as the equipment have to be um, uh, temporarily um, shipped and then registered at coming in Norway and Norway is in a Schengen space, but is not an uh, European, not considered fully European country. Uh, the the customs sometimes will ask some extra questions and documents. So this part of the whole bureaucracy sometimes can also be a little bit challenging, and sometimes delays happen. But luckily, we managed to solve them uh, properly. 
And one big challenge that is not only for the scientists, and actually I, I praise them very much because they are really able to work very long hours uh, along the day, uh, is that indeed uh, enable to analyze everything, all these objects and all that we uh, aimed for. Uh, sometimes we will work from nine to 12 hours a day. And as I was my responsible as leader of the project, it, it, it uh, let's say th this also had an impact on my uh, schedule along the day. Uh, as I had to assist them and to be present and uh, sometimes even organize some social activities. I don't complain because actually they are the, the real heroes in all this story. And uh, as I already uh, showed, we had imaging techniques, non-invasive um, on the surface, both for mapping and scanning and identification of elements and uh, possible materials in the paint layers, but also point uh, analytical instruments like micro Raman and uh, mid near VR and uh, ultraviolet visible near fluorescence and reflectance. For those points where we were mostly interested, that meaning the blue and red darkened areas. And here I only included some very preliminary analysis because the elaboration of data is still ongoing, is not finished yet. And you can see from Old Man in Barnemude in the left corner, an area from the, the lower part of the paintings where all these strokes, you can see here, for example, a red darkened area from a red lake was detected with fluorescent spectroscope. And here we have the mapping with false colors to detect uh, in red the zinc com compounds and uh, calcium in green. And of course, um, other, another painting where let's say the macro XRF uh, mapping and uh, imaging was complemented also identification with uh, cadmium sulfates and um, other type of pigments. Or in this other case where uh, this, um, landscape of uh, the canal in Barnemude, where you can actually map, and then of course in past color, create a new image painting with the distribution of different uh, materials, uh, painting materials. And then of course, uh, part of the project is also to create uh, uh, a good dissemination uh, strategy uh, through presentations and publications. And first of all, during the the access itself, I have actually created a series of posts in our personal or let's say internal um, Facebook that is work, workplace at Munch Museum where all the employees have access. And through these posts, I actually, um, uh, let's say told the story of MOLAB and what MOLAB is for uh, at Munch and what we can expect from it and so on. And of course, we also had this dissemination action externally in different platforms through Facebook and YouTube. And uh, during the MOLAB, I uh, also been involved in creating two short videos of presentation of this work and access um, um, by uh, researchers involved in, uh, in this uh, access project that were also visible uh, to, to people in different platforms like YouTube. And of course, once we will have all the data collaborated and together um, in our possession, uh, we are now um, working on this um, digitalization of research data that is a major project we have, where we aim to, to gather all the research results we got from different projects from the past or still ongoing in one unique database and that to upload these contents in our uh, TMS, which is um, uh, a software that the museums in general can use to record the objects in the collection and the movements of the objects or the analysis or the reports, the object, uh, or the reports of the treatments the objects under, undergo. And uh, this could be further on, uh, not sure when exactly, but it's work in progress uh, available so for different professionals that work in the museum and also outside. And uh, not for last, we also submitted to different conferences, abstracts for oral and poster communications. And one conference was a conference that we organized at MUNC between 21st and 23rd of March. Uh, and now we will start to work on the proceedings after the conference. So 
I really hope that one uh, publication can also be presented from, um, from this mollab campaign. Then there is another conference, Colors 2022 in Portugal in September, where we were already accepted with an oral communication. And again, a Camp CH conference in July in, um, in Ravenna. We also submitted uh, and we, um, we hope to be accepted. So from all these uh, applications or submissions for conference, um, we hope to get this year and also next year at least uh, two peer reviewed uh, publications about the access. And this was my presentation. I thank you all for attention and the patience. And now I will give the floor to Matthias Trilli. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna and Irina, for uh, this in depth presentation. <clears throat> excuse me, of what is evidently a very, very broad subject. Multi and hyperspectral imaging, as we discussed, is uh, really used a lot in uh, various cultural institutions. And you've given us a really broad overview of these techniques and of how such techniques can be usefully applied in a museum environment, as you have done, Irina. Um, what remains for us to do today is to announce the next webinar in our series, which is to take place on the 10th of May at exactly the same time. And this webinar will look at a develop the development of European collaboration initiatives in heritage science. So it will have a slightly different focus in that we will look at options and possibilities for heritage scientists and particularly heritage institutions to network and to develop uh, collaborations both on political, strategic, as well as perhaps in financial and other terms. Please do join us and encourage your institutional decision makers or policy makers to join us as well. Thank you very much indeed.